Chapter Twenty of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Eleven. God remembers Shocky. At four o'clock the next morning, in the midst of a driving snow, Rolf went timidly up the lane toward the homely castle of the Meanses. He went timidly, for he was afraid of Bull. But he found Bud waiting for him with the roan colt bridled and saddled. The roan colt was really a large three-year-old, full of the finest sort of animal life, and having, as Bud declared, a mighty sight of hoss sense for his age. He seemed to understand at once that there was something extraordinary on hand when he was brought out of his comfortable quarters at four in the morning, in the midst of a snowstorm. Bud was sure that the roan colt felt his responsibility. In the days that followed, Ralph often had occasion to remember this interview with Bud, who had risked much in bringing his fractured arm out into the cold, damp air. Jonathan never claved to David more earnestly than did Bud this December morning to Ralph. "'You see, Mr. Hartsook,' said Bud, "'I wish I was well myself. It's hard to set still. But it's a-doing me a heap of good. I'm like a boy at school. And I'm a-findin' out that doin' one's best licks for others ain't all they is of it though it's a good part. I feel like as if I must get him, you know, to do lots for me. They's always some sums too hard for a feller, and he has to ax the master to do em, you know. But see, the roan's a-stomping round. He wants to be off. Do you know I think that hoss knows something's up? I think he puts in his best licks for me a good deal better than I do for him. Ralph pressed Bud's right hand. Bud rubbed his face against the colt's nose and said, "'Put in your best licks, old fellow.' And the colt whinnied. How a horse must want to speak. For Bud was right. Men are gods to horses, and they serve their deities with a faithfulness that shames us. Then Ralph sprang into the saddle, and the roan, as if wishing to show Bud his willingness, broke into a swinging gallop, and was soon lost to the sight of his master in the darkness and the snow. When Bud could no more hear the sound of the roan's footsteps, he returned to the house to lie awake picturing to himself the journey of Rolf with Shockey and the roan colt. It was a great comfort to Bud that the roan, which was almost a part of himself, represented him in this ride. And he knew the roan well enough to feel sure that he would do credit to his master. He'll put in his best licks, Bud whispered to himself many a time before daybreak. The ground was but little frozen, and the snow made the roads more slippery than ever but the rough-shod roan handled his feet dexterously, and with a playful and somewhat self-righteous air, as though he said, "'Didn't I do it handsomely that time?' Down slippery hills, through deep mud-holes covered with a slender film of ice, he trod with perfect assurance, and then up over the rough stones of Rocky Hollow, where there was no road at all, he picked his way through the darkness and snow. Ralph could not tell where he was at last, but gave the reins to the roan, who did his duty bravely, and not without a little flourish, to show that he had yet plenty of spare power. A feeble candle-ray, making the dense snowfall visible, marked for Ralph the sight of the basket-maker's cabin. Miss Martha had been admitted to the secret, and had joined in the conspiracy heartily, without being able to recall anything of the kind having occurred at the East, and not remembering having seen or heard of anything of the sort the time she was to Boston. She had Shockey already, having used some of her own capes and shawls to make him warm. Miss Martha came out to meet Ralph when she heard the feet of the roan before the door. "'Oh, Mr. Hartsook, is that you? What a storm! This is just the way it snows at the east. Shockey's all ready. He didn't know a thing about it till I waked him this morning. Ever since that, he's been saying that God hasn't forgot after all. It's made me cry more than once.' And Shockey kissed Mrs. Pearson, and told her that when he got away from Flat Creek, he'd tell God all about it, and God would bring Mr. Pearson back again. And then Martha Hawkins lifted the frail little form, bundled in shawls, in her arms, and brought him out into the storm, and before she handed him up, he embraced her and said, "'Oh, Miss Hawkins, God hadn't forgot me after all. Tell Hanner that he hadn't forgot. I'm going to ask him to get her away from Meanses, and mother out of the poorhouse.' I'll ask him just as soon as I get to Lewisburg. Ralph lifted the trembling form into his arms, and the little fellow only looked up in the face of the master and said, You see, Mr. Hartsook, 
I thought God had forgot. But he can't. And the words of the little boy comforted the master also. God had not forgotten him, either. From the moment that Ralph took Shockey into his arms, the conduct of the roan colt underwent an entire revolution. Before that he had gone over a bad place with a rush, as though he were ambitious of distinguishing himself by his brilliant execution. Now he trod none the less surely, but he trod tenderly. The neck was no longer arched. He set himself to his work as steadily as though he were twenty years old. For miles he traveled on in a long, swinging walk, putting his feet down carefully and firmly, and Rolf found the spirit of the colt entering into himself. He cut the snowstorm with his face and felt a sense of triumph over all his difficulties. The bulldog's jaws had been his teacher, and now the steady, strong, and conscientious legs of the roan inspired him. Shockey had not spoken. He lay listening to the pattering music of the horse's feet, doubtless framing the footsteps of the roan colt into an anthem of praise to the god who had not forgot. But as the dawn came on, making the snow whiter, he raised himself, and said half aloud, as he watched the flakes chasing one another in whirling eddies, that the snow seemed to be having a good time of it. Then he leaned down again on the master's bosoms, full of a still joy, and only roused himself from his happy reverie to ask what that big, ugly-looking house was. See, Mr. Hartsook, how big it is, and how little and ugly the windows is, and the boards is peeling off all over it, and the hogs is right in the front yard. It don't look just like a house. It looks dreadful. What is it? Ralph had dreaded this question. He did not answer it, but asked Shockey to change his position a little, and then he quickened the pace of the horse. But Shockey was a poet, and a poet understands silence more quickly than he does speech. The little fellow shivered as the truth came to him. "'Is that the poorhouse?' he said, catching his breath. "'Is my mother in that place? Won't you take me in there, so as I can just kiss her once? Cause she can't see much, you know, and one kiss from me will make her feel so good.' and I'll tell her that God ha'n't forgot. He had raised up and caught hold of Ralph's coat. Ralph had great difficulty in quieting him. He told him that if he went in there, Bill Jones might claim that he was a runaway and belonged there. And poor Shockey only shivered and said he was cold. A minute later, Ralph found that he was shaking with a chill, and a horrible dread came over him. What if Shockey should die? It was only a minute's work to get down, take the warm horse-blanket from under the saddle, and wrap it about the boy, then to strip off his own overcoat and add that to it. It was now daylight, and finding, after he had mounted, that Shockey continued to shiver, he put the roan to his best speed for the rest of the way, trotting up and down the slippery hills, and galloping away on the level ground. How bravely the roan laid himself to his work, making the fence-corners fly past in a long procession but poor little Shockey was too cold to notice them, and Ralph shuddered, lest Shockey should never be warm again, and spoke to the roan, and the roan stretched out his head, and dropped one ear back to hear the first word of command, and stretched the other forward to listen for danger, and then flew with a splendid speed down the road, past the patches of blackberry briars, past the elderberry bushes, past the familiar red haw tree in the fence corner, over the bridge without regard to the threat of a five-dollar fine, and at last up the long lane into the village, where the smoke from the chimneys was caught and whirled round with the snow. End of chapter 20